Olá, pessoal. Olá. Sejam bem-vindos novamente. É muito bom estar aqui com vocês. Uh, hoje nós teremos a participação do professor Patrick Killing, que está aqui conosco, já, uh, já entrando aqui conosco. E eu vou fazer uma breve introdução do professor Patrick, uh, baseado no currículo dele, certo? Atualmente, o professor Patrick, ele é professor da University of British Columbia, no Canadá, no Canadá, né? E ele fez mestrado em genética, certo? Na Universidade Western Ontario. E também tem o PhD dele, né? O doutorado dele em bioquímica, na Dalhousie University. Ah, orienta uma série de pessoas, é, em pós-doc, né? No currículo dele, nós temos uma série de pessoas na equipe dele, é, estudantes de graduação estudantes de pós-doutorado, e ele trabalha, os projetos dele são bastante interessantes. Ele está trabalhando, então, com endossimbiose secundária em flora da quimbiota, é, com endossimbiose, ele tem projetos em endossimbiose de protistas, a origem e evolução de ato complexa, a, a função de plastídeos, a função de mitocôndrias, a a origem genética de determinados códigos e maquinários genéticos. Então, ele se interessa bastante por essas questões voltadas para a endossibiose secundária também e utilizando para isso técnicas de genômica, diferentes zônicas que nós conhecemos. Certo? Então, é, com essa apresentação, essa breve apresentação, eu passo a palavra para o Patrick. Patrick, can, uh, welcome among us. It's a pleasure. We are very honored to receive you here and uh, uh, watch your lecture. We have the, the word. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks for the um, for the invitation. And um, just a technical note: if uh, I'm talking too fast or if you can't hear me, just stop me, and I'll try okay. to correct that. Thank you so much. Oh, I want to talk. Um, today about uh, a, a number of different subjects, but around the idea of what happens to algae um, and their plastids and their plastid biochemistry when they stop being photosynthetic. And I wanna lead into a separate section at the end where I wanna talk a little bit more about um, the origin of photosynthesis and eukaryotes and, and plastids um, and some of the mechanistic details of how this happens that are starting to come to light. Um, so first, I'm gonna talk about a couple of subjects to do with non-photosynthetic plastids. And I'm gonna focus on research that's very, very current to the most, for the most part. I'll give a bit of background, but then I wanna actually focus on some things that we're learning uh, right now. And the model system that I wanna talk about are the apicomplexins, and I'm gonna use, uh, my um, cursor instead of a um, laser pointer. So I'm not actually gonna go into present presenter view very much here. So you're gonna see all this mess. Actually, I can tidy this up, make it a little bigger. Okay, so I wanna talk about apicomplexins and, uh, and coral and the origin or evolution of photosynthesis in these organisms. And I'll just get right onto it. So apicomplexins, oh dear. Wrong screen. Apicomplexins um, until recently would have been a very strange topic to have in a, a course on algae because they're a group of parasites that are well studied in parasitology, but until recently we didn't know that they had anything to do with algae. So the most famous apicomplexin is shown here, right? This, these cells inside these human red blood cells, and that's uh, the malaria parasite plasmodium. There's a number of other apicomplexin parasites, Cryptosporidium, Toxoplasma are well known, Babesia is a famous parasite of cattle, uh, but the entire group, it's a large group, it's very diverse, and the entire group uh, survives by intracellular parasitism. So they get inside other eukaryotic cells, mostly animals, they use the resources of those cells and ultimately usually kill them. Although many of the lineages of apicomplexins that we don't study very much, it's not really clear that they're uh, pathogenic. They might just be freeloaders, but they're all 
survive in this way. They get inside their host using this suite of uh, endomembrane and microtubule and cytoskeletal compound, uh, components called the apical complex. There's a picture, I'm pointing at the wrong one. There's a, I don't know, I'm not, okay. You can see my cursor now, yes? I'll assume so. So this is the apical complex where you have some microtubular structures and then a, a large number of vacuoles and membrane bound bags that, that mediate the infection process. And this is an electron micrograph of that. <coughs> I'll get back to this in a, little, in a minute, but this is the, the structures that define this group. Um, the plastid of the apical complexins was really only discovered in the Sort of leading up to 1996, Ian Wilson in England discovered the plastid DNA and went through a long period of trying to convince people it was not the mitochondrial DNA, because why would intracellular parasites have a plastid? And then Jeff McFadden first identified the organelle uh, using in situ hybridization. And this is a picture of some uh, malaria parasites uh, having been released from a, a red blood cell where the plastid has been uh, localized using green fluorescence. And so every apicomplexin parasite has one uh, and it's not photosynthetic. So this caused a lot of interest in what it does. That was well studied. What I wanna talk about is, I wanna get, I'll get back to what it does functionally, but I wanna first talk about its evolutionary origin. Because apicomplexins, although they're parasites and although no one ever really expected them to contain a, a plastid, they are actually related to a well-known group of algae, the dinoflagellates. So we've known this for quite a long time, that apicomplexins and dinoflagellates are sister groups in the tree of life. And so this should be a really easy um, question to determine how uh, the apicomplexin plastid arose because dinoflagellates have plastids, we know they're related. We should just be able to look at their plastids and compare them and say whether or not they arose from a single endosymbiotic event um, you know, in the common ancestor, or if they arose twice independently, this should be easy, but it's not because the dinoflagellate plastid is very strange, uh, just because dinoflagellates are very strange, and the apicomplexin plastid is very strange because it's not photosynthetic. Now, the real problem is that um, they've become strange in different ways. So, apicomplexin plastid genomes have lost everything to do with photosynthesis. That's not really a mystery. Uh, they're not photosynthetic. Dinoflagellate plastids, the genome has lost everything that doesn't have to do with photosynthesis. In this case, it's probably all moved to the nucleus. So the outcome of this, if you try to compare their genomes, is they have an almost perfectly non-overlapping set of genes. This is a little Venn diagram, and the dinoflagellates and apicomplexins intersect only at the ribosomal RNA. So it's very difficult to compare these plastids to determine whether they share a common ancestor or not. Um, in fact, uh, based on this data, it was impossible. The ribosomal RNAs are so divergent, it was impossible to really analyze them. So the solution to this problem actually came as often as the case in science from a completely unexpected discovery, like the apicomplex and plastid was an unexpected discovery. It was not hypothesis testing, it was exploration. So a group in Australia, were curious about the dinoflagellates that lived in coral. And a couple of the dinoflagellate strains they isolated turned out to be very interesting because they're not actually dinoflagellates at all. They were photosynthetic relatives of the apicomplexin. So vitrella and chromira shown here are small, uh, not very kind of indescript brown balls that they thought were dinoflagellate symbionts of coral, but when they did the molecular phylogeny, they determined they actually branch with the apicomplexa. So this is great because these are still photosynthetic. These are algae with normal photosynthetic plastids. And so they kind of bridge this gap between the apicomplexins and the dinoflagellates. And you get some hope that you will now be able to compare all of these groups. My group started working on this, uh, well, before this, but at this point we got interested in these organisms and we sequenced their plastid genomes this is kind of old background, by the way. And what we found is that, yes, this actually solved the problem almost perfectly because the genes encoded in these photosynthetic apicomplexin plastid genomes intersected with every gene found in either the dinoflagellates or the apicomplexins. And so it allowed us to compare them directly 
uh, with much, much greater um, confidence. And it solved the history of the apicomplex and plastid. There's a big debate about whether it was a green algae or a red algae. And this showed conclusively that it was a red algae and conclusively that the apicomplexans and the dinoflagellates uh, shared a common ancestral plastid um, here or further. Uh, and there's a few other characters that supported this to the strange rubisco that dinoflagellates use uniquely amongst algae was also found in the vitrella and chromeroplastids and various other pieces of evidence showed that these are definitely homologous plastids. Okay, but this also actually uh, started a few new questions up as good research does. And one of them was, um, it turned out that the plastids in these organisms hadn't actually been uh, a complete, they hadn't been completely overlooked, they'd just been misunderstood. And specifically the vitrella plastid, when the genome was available to us, one of the first things we noticed is that there was ribosomal RNAs already in the database for this plastid. This is a picture from an old uh, microbial ecology study where they, dis where they discovered a novel phylum of bacteria. And microbial ecology usually uses molecular data now, and they do surveys and do trees and uh, sort of determine what's there and how it changes over time. And they find a lot of new phyla of bacteria, things that we've never been able to grow. And this was just one of those. But what the vitrella plastid showed was that it wasn't actually a new phylum of bacteria. What it was was a vitrella plastid, which of course is derived from a cyanobacterium. And because their tree didn't represent algae very well, when they did the tree, it didn't fall in with the plastids like it really ought to have. It just formed its own group beside the cyanobacteria and chloroplast. And so in other words, way back in 2007, um, this representative of the vitrella plastid existed in the database, but no one understood what it was because they didn't have anything to compare it to. So we got thinking, how many algae are out there that have been sampled in microbial ecology, but have been misidentified as bacteria because the microbial ecologists that work on bacteria don't think about eukaryotes really ever. Um, and it's possible there's thousands and thousands of new kinds of algae out there that have been sampled already that no one's recognized. So Jan, who was working on this project, did a fairly comprehensive search for this. And Barsha, another student in my lab, followed this up. And the sort of, all right, I'll go back and forth between the screens. So basically the long and short of this is we've searched now through hundreds of millions of bacterial sequences from now thousands of different environments. And what we found overall is about 100,000 uh, distinct taxa of plastids, so eukaryotic organelles, that have been misidentified as some new kind of bacterium. And virtually all of these fall within known algal groups, okay? So that's important. There aren't thousands of new kinds of algae that phycology has never discovered. In fact, what this shows is that phycology has done an extremely good job of characterizing all of the main algal groups. Um, I'll show this in a minute. But there were some unknowns uh, sort of in the 10,000 um, different taxa, but um, close to 100,000 different sequences that did not fall within a known algal group. So they didn't go within the green algae or whatever. They went as a sister group to the apicomplexans. So they're not in the apicomplexans, but they're sort of beside the apicomplexans. And virtually every single sequence out of the hundreds of millions that didn't fall within an algal group is a member of this subgroup that goes with the apicomplexans. So what's this look like? This is the first analysis of this back in 2012. And what you can see here, um, so we have our cyanobacteria and then all these are different kinds of plastids. And the number indicates how many environmental clones that were called bacteria are actually a plastid from this kind of algae. So there's 4,347 uh, green uh, algae plastids that were misidentified as some bacterium, okay? But they all fall within the known diversity of green algae. They're not, they're not like, a, you know, some new kind of primary algae that's closely related to green algae. They are green algae. And the same goes for all the other groups. And stromenopiles are also extremely well represented. 
But then the AP complexins are up here. And there was a couple groups that went within the AP complexins, but most of this diversity didn't go within the AP complexin diversity. It went sister to the AP complexin diversity. There's our friend Vitrella. There's a lot of diversity of plastids around Vitrella. There's Chromera, the other one. There's not quite so much diversity of it. And then there's a bunch of other groups that we just called AP complexin uh, related lineages, uh, one through 10 or something at this point. AP complexin related lineage or ARL5 was by far the most common. And um, it was also uh, very closely related to AP complexin. And so we got particularly interested in this one. What is it? The other interesting thing about these is that every single one of them was associated with coral as were Vitrella and Chromera. And so we have this now big cloud of diversity of plastids that we don't know anything about biologically. We don't know if they're photosynthetic. We don't know if they're parasites. Some of them have relatives that are photosynthetic, Vitrella and Chromera. Some of them we really just don't know. And they're all associated with coral reefs. And so there's an interesting possibility here that coral somehow had something to do with the origin of the complexins. If, you know, the a photosynthetic symbiosis in the ancient coral relatives, you know, went wrong and photosynthesis was lost and they became parasites giving rise to the complexes. There's a couple of neat ideas like this that we're interested in chasing down. So getting back to ARL5, because it's the one that was so diverse that, or so abundant that we had some hope of maybe ever finding it. Um, I want to also emphasize that the diversity within that group is also pretty high. So this is a, a follow-up project, and you can see ARL5 isn't just one thing. ARL5 is a whole bunch of different little subclades. So there's a lot of diversity within each of these groups, and um, they seem to have some correlation with the kind of coral that it's associated with. Another thing that you can do just from the environmental data that's interesting is you can actually make some inferences about their relationship to coral and coral reefs. So if you take the plastid data from these organisms and look at how it was collected, even the ones that we didn't do, there's a lot of information about where it was collected from. We can start to piece together maybe a little bit about the biology of these things. Uh, so for example, if we look at exactly where the samples that ARL5 came from were collected, and we break it down into different categories. We have actual coral tissue, so this, the, the coral animal cells. We have the mucus that separate, that surrounds a coral reef or a coral uh, polyp. And then we have the, just the sediments from the calcium carbonate, uh, detritus from, from coral around on the reef, and then the actual seawater. You can see that the ARL5 is strongly associated with the actual coral animal. A lot of it's found in the tissue, some of it's found in the mucus, um, and these aren't even the most highly sampled parts of that environment. So there's a very strong correlation between ARL5 and coral. Whereas, kind of surprisingly, if you look at the, um, sorry, the more famous Chromera and Vitrella, we find the opposite's true. These are the photosynthetic things that are in culture that were isolated as coral photosynthetic symbionts, new coral algae. And they're not actually associated with the coral animal at all. They're actually associated with the sediment around coral. So they're found on coral reefs only, but they're not actually associated with the coral. So we believe that they probably have a life cycle stage where they go through coral um, briefly, but mostly live outside the coral uh, as free living algae. Or they could be associated with some other animal that's unique to coral reefs. Um, don't know. And this is actually kind of interesting because when you think about it, these are really the first new kind of algae that we have discovered in a hundred years. And we still don't know anything about their ecology, which is fascinating. If, if we discovered any other kind of new algae, um, We'd be, we'd be working hard on what it does in the environment, what its biology is like, how you know, its photosynthesis works and all this. But because these organisms are closely related to parasites, we've almost entirely been obsessed with comparing them to the parasites and not actually thinking about what they're doing in nature on their own, um, which is kind of a pity. It would be nice to have some good old fashioned biology and natural history about these organisms. 
But anyway, just to rein us in a bit, where are we? Well, now we have this new group of uh, organisms, arils, and we don't know anything about what they're like, but we know they're associated with coral. Whereas the vitrella and chromera, the photosynthetic algae, we no longer think that they're actually necessarily coral symbionts, but they're somehow associated with coral reefs. And we don't understand their ecology or their, their uh, relationship with coral uh, anymore. We thought we did, now we don't. So let's just review for a second what else we know about coral and apicomplexans. The answer is not very much. There's an old study of environmental diversity that found a coral uh, apicomplexan, that was just a sequence, just a ribosomal RNA sequence that was called genotype N, um, shown here. So uh, related to coccidia, it's, it goes in sort of a different place in the tree from where we see Aryl 5 for what that's worth. Um, there's also one old study, this is it, just a histology slide showing um, what looks like an apicomplex and living inside a coral. And it was called gemocystis. It was formally described based on uh, this uh, microscopy, but there's no sequence data. So we have a whole bunch of different, really, well, we don't have a whole bunch. We have a couple of observations from different things. We have one nuclear ribosomal RNA from the environment. We have a bunch of plastid ribosomal RNAs from the environment. We have one slide of a cell uh, taken from a coral. We don't know they're all the same thing. We don't know they're all different. Um, so there's a lot of questions about these, these organisms. What is Aryl-5 like? That's the first one. Is it photosynthetic? You can imagine if it's photosynthetic and it sits here in the tree, it's extremely important for understanding the evolution of photosynthesis and the, uh, the loss of photosynthesis in the AP complexum. I would suggest it's a symbiont that was uh, perhaps even beneficial to the coral. Or is it parasitic? It's entirely possible that these arils could be parasites that are a lot like apicomplexan parasites, but parasitic of a coral. Uh, they could be genocystis. It could be something else. It could be genotype N. We don't know. We can't compare these data. So this took, um, my lab has historically been mostly doing, you know, genomics and lab work and stuff like that. But this project got us out in the field and, um, because of the data that we needed to answer these questions was more ecology and biodiversity. And so I got really lucky uh, just in the terms of the timing with this particular field station right here. Uh, this station is in Curacao and the reefs right here. Uh, that's a dive shop. It's a great place to be doing work on coral. And the director of the station is a fantastic collaborator. And I actually, I got even luckier because I, sort of got a chance to make this into an opportunity to take a whole gang of people here, this whole group, on several different field trips to Curacao as a sort of a substitute for a scientific meeting. So the idea was, let's just all get together and go in the field for two weeks instead of sitting around in a dark room listening to talks or nowadays watching someone sitting in their basement. Um, it was really a fantastic, it was the best scientific meetings I've ever been to. And Forrest Rower here became a, a, a huge help to my research and a collaborator uh, now for many years. And this is Mark Verme, who's the director of the station and, a, and an expert on all things coral. And so these, are, these associations were fantastically important for the research in my lab. And, and I actually even adopted a cat from the research station. So a daily reminders of, of how important this meeting was. So we went out and started working on coral. We, uh, we collected a lot of coral, different kinds of coral, and not just uh, one model system, but we went through all sorts of varieties of corals, uh, looking for ones that had lots of genotype N or ones that had lots of Aryl-5, the object being to get the organism, see what it's like. And then we, we actually spread out a little bit to other things related to coral. So soft corals, gorgonians, uh, are very distantly related to the stony corals that make up the reef building coral. We've also been surveying them. And also in the group are anemones, sea anemones, which we also have here, of course. Um, zoanthids, uh, another interesting group that's 
related to corals, but is not a coral per se. Black corals are also not in the same group as the regular stony corals, and so we've been very interested in them. And then lastly, this little group called coralomorphs, which are a, a close sister group to the corals, but again, they're not stony corals, they're single polyp soft things. And we've mixed this up doing field work. I've actually got quite interested in photography, so I've been taking a lot of macro photos of corals that I post on the lab's website now just because they're incredibly beautiful organisms. But we also use a, a lot of, um, sorry, this is a movie, but it's a pointless movie, uh, of aquarium corals. So uh, corals are actually traded in the aquarium industry. And so we've set up a lot of aquaria in my lab and we buy small coral plugs, um, mostly sourced in Indonesia. And we're developing lab models with those just so we don't have to go out in the field every time we want to do anything. And Walden Kwong here, uh, oops, playing the wrong screen again. Walden Kwong here is the postdoc that's really taken over this project and also the cultivation of corals, which is an extremely difficult thing to keep healthy and happy. So Walden's work showed uh, a few things right away. So first of all, we were able to demonstrate that there really is one apicomplexin or one type of apicomplexin in all these different anthozoans the whole group that includes the corals and the black corals and the corgonians. And I'm not gonna go through this slide. It's a published anyway. So, but basically this is all data that shows that if you survey the same corals and look at the nucleus and the plastid and even the mitochondrion, you always find one, which means that genotype N and ARL5 are the same thing. So we always find this correlation between finding a genotype N sequence from the nucleus and an ARL5 sequence from the plastid. And Walden also showed that you can get a single mitochondrial genome out of the same samples. So that was great. So now we know what we're working on. He also showed that they're widespread. They're not just found in the, the this is the stony corals here, the corals that you're all familiar with and coral reefs, but they're also found in every other group of the of the anthozoa. So the coralomorphs, the black corals, the anemones, the zoanthids, and even the distantly related gorgonians all have them and different ones. There's a lot of diversity, as I said, and we can find them in our aquaria and they can, we can find them in the wild. So we're developing three models to look at this, pro at this organism. Uh, well, four actually. Um, the pencil coral, the golden zoanthid, and the black coral, the wire coral that's common in the Caribbean, because these don't have very much symbiodinium. Remember the symbiodinium is the dinoflagellate algae that famously makes a symbiotic association with coral for photosynthesis and coral bleaching is caused by symbiodinium leaving. And so of course, if you're trying to find an apicomplexin in a coral that's packed with symbiodinium, a closely related dinoflagellate, that's a really big problem. So these organisms don't have much or don't have any symbiodinium, and they're kind of emerging as our, as our field models for this. But we also have a lab model, which is this uh, coralomorph, which has been a really, really useful um, for something we can just grow in the lab and take things out and do experiments on. And in particular, this mesenterial filament tissue turns out to be what we're interested in. So Weldon's done many things with this. The first thing, of course, is he, we did genomics or metagenomics in this case, to get the uh, more data from the, the, the parasite. And luckily when you do metagenomics on algae, the first thing you get is the plastid. The DNA is overrepresented. Uh, you tend to get really nice plastid constructs from otherwise terrible data from the nucleus. And so we were able to assemble an entire plastid genome from the uh, ARL5 from this coralomorph. So the first thing uh, to notice about this plastid genome, it's not very big, it's 42 kilobases, and it has no photosystem. So, <coughs> so we can conclude right away it's not photosynthetic. You can't do photosynthesis without photosystems, and no one has ever observed all the photosystems moving into the nuclear genome. It's pretty inconceivable how it would target all those many membrane-spanning domains across all the membrane. So we can conclude that the ARL5 is not a photosynthetic symbiont. It's not a algae anymore. It's non-photosynthetic. However, it does have chlorophyll synthesis. So 
the ancestor of this group would have still had four genes in its plastid genome for chlorophyll biosynthesis. The rest of the pathway is encoded in the nucleus. It's related to the heme biosynthesis pathway that happens in plastids too. And the ARL5 plastid genome has all four. And if you look at the sequences of them, they're still under purifying selection. In fact, they're under more selection than anything else in the plastid genome, which suggests they're still functional. And we showed they're expressed. So this is, I, I don't know how to underscore this. This is extremely weird. Having, I don't, I don't think any other organism makes chlorophyll that doesn't do photosynthesis. And in fact, it's incredibly dangerous because of what chlorophyll does. So it's almost inviting a disaster with high energy radicals in your cell to absorb photons of light and release electrons without them having somewhere to go. Um, the organism is not autofluorescent in the way that it should be if it was expressing large amounts of photosystems with chlorophyll. It's obviously not photosynthetic. There's no process that would take advantage of these electrons. And so what they're doing with chlorophyll without photosynthesis remains pretty mysterious. I have some ideas. I tend to think that you should probably imagine it's the most boring thing you can think of. And so I wonder sometimes if chlorophyll, for example, is a feedback inhibitor of the heme biosynthesis pathway or something incredibly dull like that. But uh, I don't know. We don't know. No one has any idea. Other than that, uh, interestingly, if you look at the genome and compare it to, so here's a here's a parasitic apicomplex in toxoplasma, and you can see the ARL5 genome is almost perfectly syn uh, in syntony with the toxoplasma genome. Almost the exact same genes in the same order, except that the four chlorophyll genes have been deleted in the coccidian parasite. Uh, if you compare it to vitrella, the genome's a lot bigger and there's been a lot of rearrangements, but Basically, in terms of the genes that you find, again, ARL5 has exactly the same genes as Vitrella, except Vitrella also has the photosystems shown here in yellow. So you can sort of see in this genome, what happened was the photosynthesis was lost, the photosystems were deleted, and the genome actually stayed very similar other than that. This massive functional change, which didn't have much of a change to the, to the um, um, genome structure. Now that we have this great system, we also wanted to identify the cells. So these are some micrographs of coral tissue, or this is the coralomorph mesenterial filament in section. And you can see the, the big nematocysts that shoot out the poison harpoons that they use for feeding. And down in this uh, tissue here in the gastroderm, you can see the autofluorescence in this lower panel is autofluorescence. And you can see the Dinoflagellate symbiont, symbiodinium live here, and they're fluorescing. And if you hybridize this section with probes against uh, ARL5, you can see it's in a different part of the cell. It's not in the gastroderm, it's up in the periphery. You get strong hybridization with ARL5. And if you also hybridize them with a different fluor and genotype N, that's the nuclear marker, you get the same pattern. I have a little um, animation here that I'm going to skip. I'm just going to click on this and what would have happened was this would overlay with that and you'll see they have the same pattern. So I'll just show you that without the animation. So basically this confirms that uh, what we thought from the distribution, that these are all the same organism. There's only one apicomplex in, in coral. And we can also find it now, which is great. This is, a, sorry for the rawness of this image. I just pulled a TEM image right out of the file off the microscope that we have processed for paper, but I just didn't bother. I just thought I'd show you the raw data. So this is a, <clears throat> if you see this membranes here, we call it a parasitophorous vesicle that goes around the parasite. And inside, this is actually two parasites in this section. And they have a lot of typical apicomplex and parasite um, ultrastructure. So there's a band of microtubules around the periphery here, classic apicomplex and cytoskeletal ultrastructure. You can see them up here too. This is the nucleus. Um, these vesicles that you see all over here are reminiscent of, uh, of um, apicomplex, apicoplast, or um, apical complex vesicles. 
So we have that cytoskeleton and endomembrane structures associated with parasitism. These huge vesicles here are actually a, a bit of a, we have a bit of a bet going, me and Walden, about whether these are also part of the apical complex vesicles or whether they're the plastid. Walden's convinced these are the plastid, I'm not so convinced. They actually look a bit like a plastid in the fact that they have lots of stacked membranes, but they're just so gigantic. They don't look anything like the uh, apicomplex and plastid in any other parasite. And so if these are the plastid, it's extremely exciting. And that's entirely possible. I'm not convinced either way, but it's one of the things we're working on now is uh, localizing at the TEM level to see if these are, if these contain the ARL5 uh, ribosomal RNA, then we'll be able to prove that that is the plastid. Okay, so we're gonna recap again here. So now we, we have our tree with the dinoflagellates, our photosynthetic relatives of the apicomplex and the vitrella and chromera algae. And now we have a picture of our um, coral symbiont and we have a name, we call them coralicolids. And we know they're related to apicomplexans and now we know they're not photosynthetic. They're not, a, they're not like a symbiodinium kind of uh, symbiosis. So I am gonna move on a little bit from here I got these in the wrong order because I want to talk about the parallel origins of parasitism too in these groups of algae because it turns out this has happened many times. But first, um, that's a bit of, that's a lot of material. So I thought maybe it would be a good idea to stop and take some questions if there are any about this first part. I don't know how to do this. Oh, good. This is great. Is it possible to stimulate the production of photosystems like a chimera, like could, oh, there's more things popping up, it's hard to read. Um, can you stimulate photosystems like a chimera? Uh, so I I'm, I'm think what you mean is could we put photosystems into it and see if it started to do photosynthesis? Is that what you're asking? I'll wait for the answer to that, but in the meantime, we could accept that we can't even grow this organism. So if we could grow the organism and do genetics, we could introduce photosystems that would be incredibly complex because we think that those are proteins can't be targeted to the plastid because they have so many huge transmembrane domains, which are extremely hydrophobic. So if you got them into the nucleus, even it's unlikely that they'd be able to make their way into the plastid and get into the, the membranes. And it might not have thylakoids. So it would be a big, it seems to be pretty easy to lose photosynthesis and I'm betting it's extraordinarily difficult to gain it. That would be my answer. I'm wondering about why there's so few organisms uh, bearing or evolving plastic symbiosis, especially metazoans. What do I think? That's a good question. These have spread a lot. Plastids have moved around the different organisms quite a bit, but you're right. Some organisms seem to be quite good at it. Dinoflagellates are great at it, but why not? everything. Metazoans, um, there's a couple of cases where they have what are called kleptoplasts, which I'm going to talk about in my second half after the break. There's a, a few good cases. There's the Alicia sea slug is famous and very controversial. There's another new case with a flatworm that was recently described actually from the lab next door to mine. And in those cases, the animals take up a they basically eat an algae and rather than digest it, they keep the plastid and then they put the plastid to use doing photosynthesis. But nobody's actually ever seen an animal that has permanently integrated a plastid. So I would say, let's save that till after the break because that's almost exactly what I want to talk about is how do you pick up a plastid? This is uh, where the only question that you have on your mouth. Okay. Okay, so I should go on? Yeah, we can okay. continue or to go to the, the break when you want. I'll just carry on for a little while and do the break. Okay. After. This is a pretty closely related topic that I want to talk about for a little while. So you remember I told you that there's this thing here called the, this is called the apical complex and it's the infectious structure. So apical complexes are actually found <clears throat> all over the place in this part of the tree, not just an apical com apicomplexa. 
So Chromera, the photosynthetic algae that lives with somehow with coral reefs, it also has a similar structure. Nobody knows what it does. Perkinsis is a parasite of oysters that gets inside oyster cells, and it has an apical complex too, but it's not an apicomplexin. It's actually closely related to the dinoflagellate. This is clearly an old structure, and probably the one that represents what it <coughs> originally did is this organism called Colpidella. Colpidella, I'm unfortunately not going to talk about it today, but I love Colpidella. It's a fun subject. It's a predator, and it eats by something called mysocytosis, which is sort of like a vampire. So it latches onto a cell, and it pokes a little hole in the membrane. And instead of eating the cell, it actually starts to suck out the cytoplasm like a vacuum cleaner and fills a vacuole inside itself with the cytoplasm of its, of its prey, and then it digests it. And it uses something that looks a lot like the apicomplex and apical complex to do exactly that. And that is probably what the ancestral function of this complex was, feeding. So the ancestor is probably photosynthetic and also feeding. So it was a mixotroph and it fed using this complex. And that the complex has only then later been turned into something to get inside cells instead of sucking out the inside of cells. Okay, so it basically just used the complex to do something subtly different. Anyway, <clears throat> I wanna talk about how this complex probably led this group to be pretty good at turning into parasites, even though they would have started out being algae that were mixotrophic. So first, um, this is a giant tree of apicomplexin diversity. So these are all the groups of apicomplexins, and then these are all the groups of these things that are closely related, like vitrella and chromera that we've already heard about and culpadella. Um, and this is a reference tree for ecology. So it's not a it's not a perfect topology of how all, everything's related, but it has all the groups, okay? It was developed as a part of a reference tree project that Javi Del Campo was doing. I wanna use it to plot on a few things that we know about photosynthesis. So if we put all the plastids on this tree, this is what we see. Up here at the apicomplexa, we have lots of plastids that are non-photosynthetic. So I just left them blank, okay? So we know there's a plastid there, and we know that it doesn't do photosynthesis. And that symbiont group N is our coralicolid. Down at the bottom, we have this sort of mixed bag of plastids that are not photosynthetic, say, for instance, in these predators, and ones that still are in vitrella and chromera. But in between, we have an unacceptable number of question marks, because this is where all the fun stuff happens. And so in my lab, we're really interested in these sort of uh, big black holes. Like what, how did it go from this to this? And so these lineages here are the ones where we don't know anything. And by the way, the X's are cases where there's, it's been hypothesized or we know that the plastid is gone entirely, absolutely disappeared, nothing left, which is incredibly rare. Okay, so we wanna look at some of those middle groups and they're difficult things to work on because you can't grow them. So this is work from a couple of people in my lab, particularly Varsha, who's a student who's um, defending in a couple of weeks. And we had a couple of different approaches. In some cases, we got lucky with friends of ours who are parasitologists and found like some material from a historically described very interesting parasite, um, like this uh, thing here called peridium, which is a parasite of uh, marine snails. But in most cases, we use single cell genomics or single cell transcriptomics to be more precise. And I wanna talk about this method a little bit because it's uh, really, really useful and it's not as hard as it seems like it should be. So I'll take this as an example. These are four cells that Varsha isolated, just low tech with a pipette on a inverted microscope, just you know, picking it up, washing it. And if you look at these, these aren't just representatives of the species. These are the actual cells that she picked up. So she picked up this cell and she made a transcriptome from it by itself, not from a bunch of them or not from a culture, or not from one that kind of looked like it, but this cell, okay? And the same with all four of these. And 
After making a transcriptome and sequencing it, Varsha was able to identify a lot of genes from that cell. So for instance, this cell of monocystis, she sequenced almost 35,000 genes. And so we have this awesome data set where you have an amazing collection of genes from the genome associated with morphology and behavior, or whatever you captured on the microscope before you pick the cell up. And so we keep that one-to-one -one correspondence between the cell and the data we're getting. It's not like metagenomic where you're just kind of putting stuff together in the dark and trying to figure out what the organism would have been like. So in this case, you can document the organism and then sequence tens of thousands of genes from it. Okay, it's a fantastic method. And then just to show you what what it can be like, this is a uh, I'm sorry, this is BUSCO scores. It's just sort of a really crude approximation of how well you've surveyed a genome uh, based on a bunch of genes that people figure must be really important and probably should be kept. And 100% is really good, 0% is really bad. And what this is is a whole bunch of apicomplexins, many of which are, you know, quote unquote, finished genomes and Varsha's transcriptomes in amongst them. So you can see the transcriptomes represent the genome very, very, very well. They have almost every single gene that you could ever expect to see in that genome. In fact, they're quite a bit better than a lot of quote unquote finished genomes. Partly in some cases because the genomes aren't actually finished and in some cases because they're really reduced. Like cryptosporidium genome is done. It really is quite a good genome, but it's only got a busco of about 70%. Whereas Varsha is getting close to 100% in some of hers. So the method works, that's all I'm saying. You get nearly the whole genome when it works really well, or at least all the genes. You don't get all the introns and everything else, transcriptome. So what can you do with this kind of data? Well, previously we've been looking at these organisms and hoping to get one gene. Now we have 30,000, so you can do a lot of stuff with it. So first of all, you can figure out their relationship in the tree. So we put all these things into a tree. And these are also, these are other data that have been generated in the same kind of way. Um, there was actually another study that came out around the same time by a, a former student of mine. And I'll, also Varsha has been adding and adding and adding more data. And I've been trying to keep up with my slides, but she's actually so fast at it that I haven't got them all on here. But anyway, you can look at the tree and this has been really useful. So for one thing, we learned that this entire cloud of that poorly studied diversity at the base of the tree, um, called Gregory and Apicomplexans, are all monophyletic. That had actually been something that was disputed. People thought it was many, many different groups of early Apicomplexans, but the tree with, this is now a tree with, uh, I think, 20,000 or 20, or no, 40,000 characters and 200 genes, a bit mono, like a big, um, phylogenomic tree shows very strongly that this group is, they're all related to each other. <clears throat> um, it also showed some groups that we didn't know about. This one here turns out to be a new group of apicomplexans that uh, specializes in marine invertebrates. So that was actually unexpected and kind of interesting. It's sort of a class level um, new group of organisms. This is perhaps the most interesting though, these purple things down at the bottom. These are organisms that were observed in the past. Um, they were characterized uh, by microscopy and classified as apicomplexans. So the, the, the bottom two are classified as Gregory and apicomplexans. They should have gone in this red group. And Pridium was classified as something pretty close to the coccidia. So it should have gone up here somewhere. But what we found is they're not even apicomplexans. They look like apicomplexans, they're parasites of animals. They have everything about them makes them look like apicomplexans, but they have evolved independently of the apicomplexans from a common ancestor that was probably a mixotrophic algae. Peridium is very closely related to the photosynthetic vitrella. It's, they're very, very closely related, even though this is a, an alga that does photosynthesis to all intents and purposes. This is a non-photosynthetic parasite of animals. These things here called squirmids are really exciting because they're 
deeper than the apic complexa and all of their non-apic complexan relatives, the, the predators and the, the algae in this group. So <coughs> this means that the whole form of sort of apic complexan parasitism has evolved more than once. In fact, it's it's evolved here, we know, because of the origin of apic complexans themselves, but it also evolved twice here and here. Photosynthesis at the same time has been lost several times. It was lost here at the origin of apic complexans because chromera and vitrella are still photosynthetic, but it had to have been lost at least twice or three times in this group too, including in peridium itself, and lost in the origin of squirmids. So photosynthesis has been lost over and over and over, and parasitism has originated over and over in these groups. Um, and then this is just an aside, just very, very new work. We've also determined from the same kind of data that these, uh, it, we mostly look at the plastid and apic complexans, but we've actually started looking at the mitochondria because we realized these organisms here have lost aerobic metabolism. So no one ever actually expected these things were anaerobes, but they probably are because they've lost complexes three, four, or, um, uh, three, four, and five from the mitochondria and they've entirely lost their mitochondrial genome. So the mitochondria still looks like a normal mitochondria, and it's not like the weird little so-called mitosomes that you see in things like Giardia, uh, or for that matter, Cryptosporidium. But these things um, are actually anaerobes. Not something we saw coming, but very interesting. Barsh has also used, instead of transcriptomics, single-cell genomics, and from that got entire plastid genomes from several of these things. And we can then start to look at how the plastid genome has evolved. I'm not gonna talk about these much. These are from that marine invertebrate clade. Um, and they include the smallest of uh, any AP complex and plastid genome that's reduced uh, quite a bit further than all of the other ones. Oh, but it also includes uh, one that I do want to mention briefly, can you see that, is peridium. This is that parasite that's closely related to vitrella, but it's a parasite of uh, marine snails. And it's interesting because its plastid genome, you can see these are roughly to scale, is quite a bit smaller. Um, and if you look at what it's done, it has evolved exactly the same way as the malaria parasite's plastid genome has done. So basically, the two genomes are virtually identical in what genes they still contain, and even in the order of those genes. But yet they diverge from a common ancestor that predated apic complex and plastid, and they both evolved from photo, different photosynthetic ancestors. So there's a lot of parallelism here. Things evolve in exactly the same way in parallel twice, or three times, or four times. So you got to be a little bit careful about interpreting this kind of data because you look at these two things, you kind of go like, yeah, right, they're closely related. They have the same plastid, but actually they've come to that place from a normal photosynthetic plastid uh, just twice independently. And if you look at the function, you see the same thing. So um, I'm going to I'm going to talk about these four pathways. This is a tree of the organisms that we're talking about. And these four pathways are the plastid pathways that explain why they still have a plastid. None of them are photosynthetic. Well, Chromera and Vitrella are, but the rest of them are not photosynthetic. And the plastid, as you I'm sure know, doesn't just do photosynthesis. It also makes isoprenoids, it makes fatty acids, it makes iron sulfur clusters, and it makes heme. In some organisms, it does other things too. It makes various amino acids, it makes shikimate, it makes lysine. But in these organisms, these are the four pathways that it uh, does in addition to photosynthesis. And so if you look at the pathways and their distribution, the, the isoprenoid pathway, the DOCS-P pathway, is the one that's been identified as the most important to explain the origin of, or the retention of these plastids and the parasites. If, and that's because the host analogous pathway to make isoprenoids has been lost long before even the APs and the dinos diverge from each other. So this pathway is really essential and explains why the plastid has been capped in almost everything. Uh, whereas these pathways are a little bit um, 
a little bit more complicated. Heme is kind of scattered all over the cell, synthesis, some in the mitochondrion, some in the plastid, some in the cytosol. Iron sulfurs and, um, and fatty acids can be lost, uh, like tyleria has lost fatty acid biosynthesis in its plastid, for example. So they're a little bit less conserved, but this pathway here, if you don't have it, it suggests like cryptosporidium, you just don't even have a plastid. So what do the new organisms look like? Well, they basically are the new kinds of, uh, of um, uh, parasites. Peridium has evolved much like, say, malaria. It's kept all four of these same pathways, including the essential uh, Matt Dox P1. This platyprotium represents that group of called squirmids at the base. It uh, also has the essential Dox P and it's lost its, um, its fatty acid biosynthesis pathway. So it would look like other kinds of parasites like tyleria, pyroplasmid, things like that. Maybe more interesting are the gregorines because people thought that they must have lost their plastid entirely. And we showed that half of them have, in fact, they don't have anything to do with the plastid. But it turns out there still is a gregorine parasite in one subgroup of gregorine or gregorine plastid. And it actually has been kept not for the essential isoprenoid pathway, but it's been kept specifically to make fatty acids, which is a bit of a surprise. Okay, so let's recap this and I'll end the first section here. So we went from this, we had this huge tree with all this diversity and we had this big bunch of question marks in the middle that were bothersome things that we really needed to know the answers to. And now we've turned it into this. So now we know that most of these organisms have plastids that are not photosynthetic. We know that plastids have been lost twice once in a subgroup of the gregorines, once in the cryptosporidium, and twice, again, independently. These aren't related to each other, so that's happened twice. Um, and that leaves only two groups that we don't know about. Um, I have a student working on this group right now. Um, there's no question it will have a plastid based on where it goes in the tree, but we're really interested to see what it's like. Um, and we're submitting the transcriptomes and genomic sequencing, actually, we did a few days ago. So I hope that we have an answer to this question very soon. And this is a strictly environmental ribosomal RNA clade. So no one's ever seen these organisms or knows anything about what they're like. They're another one of these groups that we have to go out and find. Um, could well be one of the arils. So we don't know about those ones. And then I just wanna end with a couple more things. The origin of parasitism from these photosynthetic relatives is the, I, I wanna underscore how this has happened many times. I mentioned these two, Peridium, platyprotium, the squirmids have evolved from two different places from photosynthetic ancestors and turned into intracellular parasites. But there's actually more that I haven't mentioned and they're, hap and they're coming out all the time. A few years ago, I was involved in the study of a human parasite that was actually killing a patient in China and it was a red blood cell infecting uh, parasite that they had identified as Babesia which would branch up here in the pyroplasms. And once we got sequence data from it, we realized it wasn't the BZ at all. The reason why none of the drugs and none of the diagnostics were working is because it was actually closely related to Culpadella, the predator that does that has the non-photosynthetic plastid. Um, fortunately, she was cured um, and we've never seen the parasite again. It would be nice to get um, a sample of that to figure out what it's like. Uh, the group that published the Gregorine data in parallel to ours also, when we found Peridium, they found another parasite that branches not with Vitrella, but with Chromera. And it's also an intracellular parasite that was mistakenly identified as a Gregorine. So again, another origin of this very specific mode of parasitism independently. And just recently, uh, another one was published in China and it was a human nervous system parasite from ticks that was transmitted by a tick bite that was uh, identified finally as being related to Culpidella again, but a different kind of Culpidella. So there's something about these organisms, although they're you know, photosynthetic algae ancestrally that makes them very, very likely to become parasites, which is a really interesting confluence of these two different kinds of symbiosis. And 
I'm going to take a break, but I'll take some questions first. Some questions, people? Actually, I have one, but I don't know if the theme will be explored in the future of your presentation. Uh, we know that uh, we have some fresh water at the complexes also. Uh, there are some uh, evolutionary relationships for the conquest of the, this kind of environment by the epic complex. And uh, another, uh, another question is, we also observed a lot of parasites in, the, in this group. And uh, it's strange because the group changed uh, in, in some point uh, for the, uh, how can I say, uh, well, the, the ancestor, it uh, was uh, photosynthetic and after became parasite, uh, another group is completely different. Uh, there are some evolutionary relationship to explain this, this kind of change. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the first question, the, the freshwater, <clears throat> if I understand it right, the, the correlation between the apicomplexin and the environment tends to be through the host. And so clades of apicomplexins tend to be infecting different kinds of animals. And so if those animals are in the freshwater or marine or whatever, the apicomplexin doesn't care. But if the animals are separated, so their, their environment, if you think about it, is not the, the water, it's the animal. So they tend to kind of be separated based on that. So there's lots of freshwater ones. And soil, there was just a night nice study, uh, I forget where from, but it was, um, um, it actually might've been from the Amazon. It was a rainforest soil um, survey where they just looked at all the microbial diversity in the rainforest soil. And the number one common thing was apicomplexins. And it was gregarine. It's these, these le less studied deep branching apicomplexins. And it's because that gregarine clade that I told you has lost um, the plastid, there's an enormous number of those infect insects. And so probably what's in that soil is spores of millions and millions of insect infecting gregarine. So they're very, very common all over in every environment. We see the same when we look in the ocean. Apicomplexins are, they're not the most common because dinoflagellate parasites are more common, but they're up there um, and in the sediment particularly. Your second question <coughs> is a fascinating thing about this. So the ancestral state, if you reconstruct it, is a thing that was photosynthetic. It used the weird rubisco, but it was photosynthetic. And it was also probably eating with mysocytosis like copadellids do. Uh, and would have had this some form of this apical complex. But we have never found an organism that matches that description. So far, we find things that are mysocytotic or photosynthetic. But we've never actually found that organism that's both. That would be one of the things I would love to get is an algae that still eats with mysocytosis. But we've never seen one. But that's the, in, the inferred ancestral state. So it would be great to get that. And I think the reason why they're connected is because mysocytosis as a means of feeding easily turns into a way of getting inside other cells just because of the mechanistic, like how it works. I think it very simply translates into, instead of sucking the cytoplasm out of a cell, I think it's easy to turn that into pushing your way into the cell. And so if you have an algae that's feeding that way, it's probably relatively easy to have it then suddenly get inside the other cell. And then that can transition to parasitism simply by losing photosynthesis. Dinoflagellates lose photosynthesis a lot too. And it's probably because they're also eating a lot. If you're, if you think about photo, so one of the things I tell students a lot is when you're thinking about these organisms, we get mixed up between nutrients and energy. Uh, ecologists don't, but evolutionary biologists do. And so, you do photosynthesis to get energy, but it doesn't give you any nutrients. 
if you want to get all your vitamins and amino acids and everything else that you need, you have to be either be able to make them, like some algae are really good at that, but most algae aren't. And so they have to eat to get nutrients and photosynthesize to get energy. So if you're doing that uh, and you stop photosynthesizing, you still have a source of energy, which is your food, and you might survive. If you're not eating, but making all your nutrients and you stop doing photosynthesis, I would argue you're more in danger of dying. You have to become an osmotroph pretty quickly. So I think these organisms that are mixotrophs, it's probably just easier to survive the loss of photosynthesis. Doesn't mean it's a good thing, but all you have to do is survive. Good idea. Another question? People? No? I think that we can continue the presentation then. So I would like to have a break if that's all right. Can we do the break now? Yeah. Okay, so I uploaded the um, uh, YouTube uh, link to a short video. It's about six minutes long, I think. It's a, it's a demonstration. I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit when I get back, but I thought, um, it, would it be okay to have, what, like a 15 minute break? Would that be all right? I put the link in the chat. Okay, so um, I'm gonna come back in 15 minutes, okay? 15, okay. And it'll give people time to have a little break and watch the video. Okay, good, good. All right, good day, great. Um, I'll see you then. Thanks. Okay. Give me a little bit of
Olá, pessoal, estamos de volta. Hello, Kevin, again. Well, uh, I was I was explaining for some friends that uh, I have a risk of my internet to go out because uh, here in, in my state uh, it's very hot, very warm, and uh, we have a, a, a storm coming from uh, to here. Then, well. If I'm not here, I, if I'm not respond to you, I will come back uh, uh, briefly. Okay. Your your sound, your mic is in the mute. No, here in the in the stream yard is mute oh, still. You can click in the symbol of the microphone. That good? Yeah, now I can hear you. We can start. All right, thank you. Okay, <clears throat> so I hope everyone enjoyed the video. I hope you watched it. It's actually a fun thing to do. I have one here somewhere. You can make these little um, do-it-yourself microscopes that are like the ones that Anthony Van Lohenhoek used to first see the microbial world. and. Um, they actually work fairly well. I was really surprised that you could just hold it up to your webcam and actually see things on slides, but it's kind of a fun thing to do. Um, if you ever teaching or have to do an outreach, um, you know, with students from public school or something like that, the microbial world's abstract and difficult to get people interested in. And I, I found this is a great way to sort of pique people's kind of curiosity because they kind of amazing that you can make yourself a lens um, with a lighter and a bit of broken glass and actually make yourself a microscope. People find it very, I think they find it um, kind of like exciting that they can do that. So anyway, I hope that was useful. Um, if you wanna, if anyone is interested, there's. If you find my lab's webpage, there's actually detailed instructions for how to do it um, in a class, and also has instructions for using a, a laser uh, to um, work out the power of your lens, and it's a really great class activity to learn a little bit about optics too. Okay, but actually I wanna keep talking about plastids, and I'm gonna change gears a couple times here, so I'll throw in spots for stopping for questions again. Um, and I wanna go back in time further and talk about the origin of plastids and the origin of organelles in general. And the reason why I wanna talk about this is because this is a really exciting time in this field. The endosymbiotic origin of organelles has always been something interesting. And it's actually what got me interested in this field when I was an undergraduate taking second year cell biology learning that the mitochondria and the chloroplast had come from bacteria and that we had bacteria living in our cells. That was that thing that got me really excited about biology. Like I left that class thinking like, oh, this that's the neatest thing ever. And so it's always been an interest of mine. And so it's kind of fun for me right now that the field is in the middle of an intellectual revolution. And so if you read textbooks or most review articles right now, there's nothing there's nothing in the news. But if you go and talk to the people who are actually working on it, there's a lot changing right now that's going to make its way into the textbooks and stuff. And so I want to actually talk about a bit of that because it's super exciting and it relates to symbiosis very generally. And so this slide here is just for fun. And I, and I want to emphasize a few things about how this kind of science is difficult and very similar to archaeology because we're looking at things in the present day, um, bits and pieces, and we're trying to piece together 
what they were like in the past. And all of our biases as humans come into play the same way that they do in archaeology. And I show this picture because this is a very famous archaeological screw up where this object here was found and it was interpreted to be a crown. Um, partly because that's what the archaeologists really wanted it to be. It was an exciting looking thing and that was an exciting answer. And, and so it was thought that like they saw it, they had biases, they went, oh, that's a crown. And so it became a crown because that's what they thought it was. In fact, mm -hmm. if you look at a more academic reconstruction of what it probably was, it was probably a bucket. So it's a lot less exciting than a crown, but it's correct. Um, it probably looked sort of like this over here where you had the whole thing was upside down and the band on the top of the crown was actually the handle of the bucket. And so you're missing bits and pieces. All the wood was missing. All they had was the metal and they tried to interpret it and they picked the wrong answer. And we do this a lot in biology too. When we're looking at evolutionary questions that are extremely old, we're missing a lot of this context. Things are not there for us to see and we make mistakes. And I want to argue that um, organelle evolution has been really um, sort of messed up the same way. So if you look at, if you just go online and do a Google search for, you know, endosymbiosis and organelles, <coughs> you get what I would argue is an extremely low quality of explanations, much worse than most biological things that you might search in that way. So here's a few examples. And uh, up in the second, take a look, get a little warmer. So we have these incredibly vague, and yet they still manage to be wrong models of a little cell getting eaten by a big cell and turning into an organelle. It's wrong because they're showing a bacteria as a blob with one membrane, the bacteria that gave rise to the plastid and the one that gave rise to the mitochondrion had two membranes. And so, and this is functionally really important and yet the way they've drawn it is wrong, despite the fact that there's almost no detail in this figure, they've, they've still got it wrong. This one's exactly the same, only pretty, but still wrong. This one's wrong. What I wanna talk about though is the, is the order of events rather than the actual events they're showing here. And usually they don't even bother trying to explain this, but in this one they have. So I wanna go through this. This is sort of your textbook, how an organelle evolves from an endosymbiosis. Okay, so you got your, your host up here and your endosymbiont down here with its own genome. So they have, basically it starts with endosymbiosis. So something gets eaten and it is fixed. It's part of the cell. OK, and then <clears throat> after some time, they have gene transfer shown right here. So a gene moves from that endosymbiont genome into the nucleus of its host. OK, so that's the second step. And then somewhat later, they have the step that's often characterized as the distinguishing feature of symbiosis uh, or of uh, organelles as opposed to symbiosis, which is protein targeting. And here you have that gene in the, uh, in the nucleus gets a protein targeting information attached to it, and that sends the protein back to the organelle, okay? So this is the order of events that you often see if anybody even bothers to try to spell it out. Usually endosymbiosis is, um, I like to call it a magic word where people, it's like abracadabra, and they think that explains it. It doesn't explain anything, it's just a word. We wanna know the mechanism. And so this is the mechanism that you most often see. So you get this fixation of the cell inside another cell, you get a gene transfer, and then you get protein targeting. All right, so the problem with this kind of model and basing it on actual data is that the um, events you're trying to explain only happen once and they happened a long time ago. And this is a fortuitous find of mine on, on Google. Uh, once long ago, gives rise to folk tales and fairy tales. And I would argue that that's basically what we're trying to do with endosymbiosis. If we keep trying to explain these things based on a single event, like the origin of mitochondria, 
you're, you're really just making it up. It, it's something that might be consistent with the data, but it's not a particularly good model. So how can we do it better? Well, one thing is if we had multiple events and recent events, we would have this, um, it wouldn't be once and it wouldn't be long ago. And we'd be able to say a lot more about what happened. And so I want to talk about cases that are recent multiple events. We've already seen, I've already been talking about multiple events with the origin of the ape complex and parasite and the loss of photosynthesis. And the reason why those are so interesting to me is because they're multiple parallel events. We can look at how they happen over and over again. This is extremely useful when you're looking at evolution. And so for this part of the talk, I want to talk about I might get to three ideas, but I think probably not. I'll probably just talk about two things. And they're things that are important that you might have learned or taken for granted, but that are probably wrong. And the first, is, and this is about endosymbiosis, and the first is about mutualism, that it's a good thing, a happy thing, that people are, or that the cells are cooperating happily together. I think that's almost always wrong. And the directionality, that it's going somewhere, you know, that you see an association and it's going towards being an organelle. I think that's always wrong. And also, uh, more specifically, the order of events when it does go into that transition to being part of the cell. I think we have it exactly backwards. Okay, well, let's talk about mutualism. Uh, here, I'm going to take a divergence. I'm not going to talk about chloroplasts or plastids for a second, but it is relevant. Um, as you'll see. Instead, I want to talk about a different system, which is in the cilia. This is a, I don't think I can show this with a movie. Oh yeah, I can. This is a great cilia. This is a Euplodes, and its cilia form these little bundles that act like legs, uh, so it walks on its cilia. You see the legs all coordinated, they're, they're doing like a coordinated walking sort of motion. So it actually looks like a little insect, but it's, but it's a single cell cilia. There it goes, walks on surfaces and eats bacteria. Um, fantastically interesting organism in many ways. And in my lab, we work on one subgroup of cilia. This is Vittorio, who's uh, I think the leading expert in the world on this. And it's this clade B. And the reason why we work on this clade B, it's got many different related species of Euplodes. And they all have an endosymbiont that they that they need to have. It's an essential endosymbiont. That's called polynucleobacter. And it's believed to have been picked up here at the origin of clade B. And all clade B euplodes currently have it. And so if you looked at this data, you would interpret this as uh, an obligate, mutually beneficial symbiosis. Here's a euplodes cell. This is this giant macronucleus, it's called, and all these red things inside our polynucleobacter, which forms these long strings, um, highly adapted uh, to this endosymbiotic lifestyle. So all the related ciliates have it, and the, they all have the same bacteria. So an ancient symbiosis, OK? Turns out polynucleobacter is actually fairly common in nature, too, free living. It looks totally different. It's just a tiny little bacterium, not the long stringy thing. But it's really common in freshwater environments. So here's where it gets weird. If you take a whole bunch of clade B uh, uh, euplodes, different species, different strains of the same species, a bit of a whatever you can get, and you sequence all of the, the whole genome of the bacterium, and then you go out in nature and sequence a whole bunch of the genomes of the free living bacteria, if the endosymbiosis was a single ancient endosymbiosis, as all evidence indicates, you would expect to see a tree where there is a a bunch of free living polynucleobacters, and then from it, one single distinct clade of the endosymbionts. And if you're lucky, the phylogeny of that clade will mirror the phylogeny of the host, that you'll see, you know, the speciation of the host leading to the speciation of the symbionts. That's, that's what you should see. But that's not what you see. So this is a tree based on the whole genome of polynucleobacters. Blue is free living and yellow is symbiotic in some strain of Euplodes, which is shown at the end here. And what you see is that every single strain of endosymbiotic uh, polynucleobacter uh, 
is inferred to have evolved independently from a free living strain of polynucleobacter, except possibly these two, it's hard to say. In other words, the symbiosis is extremely ancient. It goes back to the origin of clade B, but the symbionts are not. Every single symbiont we see today originated recently from a different free living uh, relative. And then if you look at the genomes and how they're organized, what you see is this is sort of a, uh, reflected in how the genomes are decaying and, and turning from a large free living bacterial genome into a endosymbiotic genome. So this is a bunch of biochemical pathways and across the top are a whole bunch of these strains of symbionts. And you can see some pathways, they look about the same, like this top one, they're, they're keeping some genes and losing some genes and it's mostly the same genes. Well, that's because these genes that have the black bar around them have more than one function. They, they function in the glyoxalate cycle, but they also function something else. So they're under the same selection. If you look at pathways, let's take biotin, where there isn't any such uh, constraint, what you see is that they're losing the genes in random. So each strain is losing a randomly different subset of the genes, okay? Uh, and actually, this is really fun because uh, if you don't see that, it suggests that there's another function that we don't know about. <clears throat> so it's a really cool tool to learn about different functions of genes. But basically what this is showing is that these genes are, the genomes are all decaying from the large, highly uh, selected for genes in the free living symbiont or the free living strains of bacteria into the chaotic mass of these symbiotic strains over and over and over independently. So every one of these strains represents a completely independent symbiotic event. So what's going on here uh, could be represented like this. At the top, this is what we sort of expect. This is, the, this is what people think symbiosis is like, where symbioses are ancient. Um, and this is true in some cases, this is an aphid. And you see cases where a symbiont has entered that lineage a long time ago, and its genome decays in this really uh, predictable sort of way where you start with a large genome of a free living bacteria and then it gets full of pseudogenes and transposons and there's deletions start to happen a lot. And then the genome gets decayed down to a little size and then eventually you get these tiny, really compact, super efficient genomes. Um, and this is the, the hallmark of a long-term symbiosis that's kind of our null hypothesis that we expect them all to be like this. But what we're saying is most of them actually aren't like that. This is the exception. What's happening in this case <coughs> is a repeated uh, version of this, but with a different endpoint. So in this case, the symbiont comes in early, but it's quickly replaced by another one. And then in subgroups, different symbionts from different subgroups are replaced over and over and over again. So the reason why the symbionts are all new is because every time you pick up a symbiont, its genome starts to decay and the host is just using it. The symbiont's as good as dead in evolutionary time. So at an ecological time scale, it looks like mutualism because the two need each other to survive. But on an evolutionary time scale, it's not mutualism at all. It's extremely exploitive where the host is using the symbiont. The symbiont is an evolutionary dead end. It is going to go extinct. There's almost no way out of that uh, rabbit hole. And what happens is before it goes extinct, the host picks up a new free living strain that's destined to replace it. And it starts going into this um, mode of genomic degradation, which makes the existing symbiont obsolete and it just dies. So <clears throat> the, um, the idea that this is a mutualistic partnership because it's ancient is false in two ways. The first is it's not ancient. And because it's not ancient, it's also not mutualistic. The host needs the symbiont. The symbionts, I guess they need the host, but it's not doing them any good. I uh, liken this to um, uh, a prisoner on death row. So the state is looking after that prisoner. They're giving them a place to live and food, but it's not a good place to be. You're not. It's not like a mutualism because ultimately the state is gonna kill you. So 
this is what symbiosis, like a lot of cases of symbiosis that we're familiar with are probably like. And we tend to look at them in a short term and say, oh, mutualism. But it's just not the case. Many, many times it's actually much more exploitive. And then just to show you one more generalization about this, that's actually quite useful. And that's this, if you see, if you think about this kind of relationship and, and just forgetting about mutualism for a second, if you think about, and by the way, this is an extremely complicated slide, so don't try to read it. I'll walk through it slowly. If you think about who's running it, who's gonna benefit? The, the, the partner that's gonna benefit is the partner who's probably running this show. And so on one side, we have the symbiont driven. Actually, I'm gonna start with the host driven. So if the host is gonna benefit, then it doesn't care about the symbiont's long-term survival. It makes no difference. As long as it can pick up a new symbiont, it doesn't care. The symbiont can go extinct. This is what the example I showed you in Euplodes is like, where the host needs the symbiont and the symbiont is getting used up, thrown away and killed by the host over a long period of time. So this is a host-driven symbiosis. And these turn out to be really common. Even in cases where you see something that looks like mutualism, it's actually this. The host is in a, in a long time frame using up its symbiont, throwing it away and replacing it. The other side of the equation, which are also very common are here, we're symbiont driven. And so a lot of times we see a bacterial symbiont that has that nice little compact genome where it's uh, obviously been there for a long time. And we go, oh, that's, that's, a, that's a long term symbiosis. It must be mutualism. But it turns out that also isn't because the symbiont is moving from host to host. And so here you have a case where a symbiont originates in a host lineage and then zips over to a different host lineage and zips over to a different host lineage. This turns out to also be very, very common because there's some groups of bacteria who have just made this their niche. They're really good at living inside eukaryotes, but they're not doing the eukaryote any good. Frequently, they're actually pathogens, but lots of times they're not pathogenic either because that's actually pretty smart evolutionarily, don't kill your host, just don't do anything. So I call these freeloaders. They get into a host, they live there, that's what they do. In evolutionary time, they move on to a new host, maybe no damage is done, maybe a little bit, but they're not that harmful. So that razor's edge of mutualism is probably extremely rare. There's probably always one side of the equation is benefiting a lot more. There's probably exploitation in there somewhere. And this is a, a massive misunderstanding, in my view, of especially endosymbiosis um, that we have to start to reckon with if we're going to understand uh, these sort of processes. Now, I want to talk about some of the stuff with respect to plastids, but I thought this would be a good place to stop and I'll see if there's any questions first. Can I move on? Any questions, people? I think not yet. Okay. We can continue. Okay. All right. Okay. So let's relate this back to the algae and the origin of plastids. And again, we have this problem that, you know, it happened once and a long time ago. But And so the order of events is difficult to see. But I want to try to convince you that the order of events that we usually think about is backwards. So again, that's this where you have, uh, I'm not gonna go through it in detail, but first you have the endosymbiosis. So a cell gets eaten by another cell. It's often, people make jokes like, oh, it's like um, indigestion. It ate something and then it got stuck, okay? So then you got a cell living inside you and it's natural, there'd be then gene transfer, why not? And then after there's gene transfer, protein targeting. So what I'm gonna argue is that the more logical model is the exact opposite. Okay. How am I going to argue that? Well, this is the <clears throat> this is the a little scheme of the origin and spread of symbionts that are plastids that I've published in the past, where you have the primary endosymbiosis, the eating of a cyanobacteria gave rise to the three primary lineages, reds, green flocophytes, and then lots of secondary symbioses gave rise to all these different kinds of algae that we all know and love. And then, of course, the dinoflagellates are special, and they've done one special thing about them is that they've done this tertiary symbiosis where some dinoflagellate has eaten uh, a menopile, 
a haptophyte or a cryptomonad. And then these are in different states of integration, but they're broadly referred to as tertiary symbioses. Okay, because the because the thing that got eaten was a secondary symbiont already, and so we we call it tertiary symbiosis. And it happened three times independently. I love this, and it also happened pretty recently. I also love that. The reason why is because <clears throat> these events even are extremely ancient. This event is really ancient, so it's hard to work on. Uh, even these ones, we don't know what kind of red alga, and we don't even know if it only happened once or if it happened three times or, you know, people say seven times. It's, it's up in the air. In my opinion, we just don't know. So there's a lot of uncertainty about this. And when you're trying to resolve phylogenetic trees, you don't want to see that kind of uncertainty. These things happen recently with extremely well-defined hosts and symbionts. We know not only what that it was a dinoflagellate that ate something, but we know what kind of dinoflagellate. We know what it ate, not just the haptophyte, we know what kind of haptophyte. And so if you were to take one of these tertiary symbionts and sequence everything, you would be able to look at a gene and say, well, that goes in exactly the place we think it would go if it came from the host or if it came from the symbiont. And this gives you the ability to sort of dig into these events at a mechanistic level that you just can't do with the old events. So that means, so this is recent. This is great. It's not multiple times, but it's the recency of this. It's fantastic. And I want to talk about this group, the Carinaceae. So the multiple events comes from a collaborator of mine, extremely amazing protistologist in Woods Hole, Becky Gass. So she does a lot of work in Antarctica. And one of the things that she's worked on is the Carinaceae, and she's made two discoveries that are extremely interesting to me and very important. And I have to say, I don't think that they've got the kind of sort of credit that they deserve. The first is that she showed that Carinaceae have tertiary plastids, but they've evolved more than once. So this is like the ciliates and their bacteria. These organisms, Carinia and Carlidinium, we know the hosts are very closely related. They're in the same subgroup of dinoflagellates. We know they both have haptophyte tertiary plastids. We've known that for many, many years. And what, what uh, Becky showed is that, yes, that's all true, but they're different haptophyte plastids. They're very closely related, but they're not the same ones. In other words, these two plastids that look the same and are in, they're closely related and they're in closely related hosts, have evolved twice independently. This is fantastic, but it gets even better because then Becky also showed, or what she discovered was another organism called RSD, which stands for the Ross Sea Dinoflagellate. It's an Antarctic dinoflagellate and it's closely related to the Carinaceae, the host is, but it doesn't have a plastid, it has a kleptoplast, okay? And a kleptoplast is a plastid that it got from its food so it eats a, an algae and it digests most of the algae, but keeps the plastid and does photosynthesis for a certain amount of time. And then it will ultimately digest that plastid and have to eat another one. So it's not permanent. It's a transient form of photosynthesis. It's, uh, but it's still extremely picky about what kind of plastid and so forth. So Becky's now, you know, generated this fabulous system where you have a kleptoplastic dinoflagellate that's closely related to two tertiary plastid containing dinoflagellates, all of which have different haptophytes. Because I should say this haptophyte that, um, that's taken up in this kleptoplasty is also, it's a haptophyte, but again, it's a different one again. So we have three different um, haptophytes in two different kind of relationships. So my lab and primarily a postdoc, Lily, uh, started a collaboration many, many years ago with Becky um, to look into different things about this. Becky's really interested in the physiological um, role of the plastid in RSD and how it functions. And we're interested in its evolutionary origin and what it can tell us about the process of plastid integration. Um, if you think about it in a way, this organism is, is sitting on this knife edge of having a klepto, like have, eating food and having a plastid, whereas the other ones have tipped over twice and into this sort of permanent relationship. Okay, so we did loads of sequencing of uh, 
Kareni ACA and RSD. And we pulled out everything that has anything to do with the plastids in all of them to get a summary of what's going on. The first thing that was a bit of a surprise is that RSD, even though the host component of it is not photosynthetic, still had a plastid of its own that nobody knew was there. It wasn't something that we could see in the electron microscope and it wasn't something that had been known to exist, but it still has one. So this is a little, a, a bit of a complicated slide, I'll walk you through it. So it has its own plastid. Over here, we have a column of RSD, crania and carlidinium. And these slides are all gonna be color coded exactly the same way. These are genes that are um, plastid targeted proteins of plastid functions. And they're the exact same functions we talked about before the break because thanoflagellates and AP complexins are closely related. So they do isoprenoids, they don't actually do fatty acids, but they do heme and iron sulfur cluster assembly. Okay, so these are genes in those same pathways that we talked about in the AP complexin. And if it's kind of yellowy orange, uh, then it's a dinoflagellate gene. If you do a tree, it goes with the dinoflagellates. If it's purple, it's a haptophyte gene. If you do a tree, it goes with the haptophyte. And the leader, is a slightly darker color, and that suggests that it's targeted to a dinoflagellate or a haptophyte type plastid. We can tell the difference. And then other colors mean they're just horizontal transfers things from other kinds of algae mostly. Okay, so what do we find? So if you look at all the genes that have to do with functions that aren't photosynthesis, we find that crinia and carlidinium have both. So they have a dinoflagellate plastid, and the haptophyte plastid version of many of these pathways. Sometimes not the whole thing, and we don't know exactly what's going on there, or sometimes one pathway is, you know, where the dinoflagellate has gone and it's only got evidence of the haptophyte plastid. These are a little unclear, but they appear to have a lot of redundancy. Like they still have uh, an original dinoflagellate plastid doing some of these jobs, but it's also happening in the new plastid from a haptophyte. What's much more clear is that RSD does have a dinoflagellate plastid and it's doing all of these jobs. So that's shown here. There's still an original dinoflagellate plastid and it's getting every gene that has to do with non-photosynthetic functions. It being, the proteins are all targeted to that plastid and they're all derived from that plastid. <coughs> so the kleptoplast from the haptophyte is doing none of these biochemical pathways. And then if you look at, oh dear. If you look at the photosynthetic genes though, you get a different story entirely. So here, um, as you would expect, the crinia and carlidinium, which have these haptophyte plastids, have a photosynthetic gene that are mostly derived from haptophytes. Exactly what you'd expect. All of the photosystem genes and whatnot look like most of them are haptophyte genes. So there, they have proteins for photosynthesis targeted to their their, their plastid that's derived from a haptophyte. Whereas, and, and in the case of RSD, you see again even more clear cut exactly the same pattern. So in other words, RSD has partitioned all of its plastid functions. So it, it's taking up this kleptoplast and it's using it for photosynthesis, but nothing else. And it has retained its old plastid, its old dinoflagellate plastid, and it's doing everything else it needs to do with that. Whereas in the ones that have a permanent plastid from a haptophyte, it's a little bit more mixed up where they have actually functions that are taking place in both these plastids, but all the photosynthesis is taking place in their new tertiary plastid. Um, so that division of labor is extremely interesting and important to understand the early stages of uh, the integration of a new organelle. But it's actually, uh, I should skip back to this, it's actually not the most important thing. The most important thing that we found was that some of these plastid targeted genes that go to the kleptoplast, or all of them, I should say, are actually encoded not, they're not encoded in the haptophyte anymore. They've moved into the nucleus of the dinoflagellate. This makes perfect sense in Korean carlidinium. We've known this for years. So as the haptophyte was taken up and, you know, as during the, the evolution of the plastid, many 
genes from the haptophyte moved into the nucleus of the dinoflagellate and are targeted back to the organelle. We knew that. But in the case of RSD, there's a lot of them. They're in the nucleus of the dinoflagellate and they're targeted to the kleptoplast. So these are genes that are in the host that are targeted to the transient chloroplast that is eventually going to chew up and degrade. This is interesting in itself because in other cases of kleptoplasty, the famous one being the marine worm, Alicia, we've been arguing for years about whether the animal, this came up earlier, whether the animal had in, was, uh, the genome encodes any genes that are targeted to the plastid, because it'd be fascinating if an animal had plastid targeted genes. And it's been a huge debate, a very acrimonious debate. In this case, there's no question about it. The dinoflagellate encodes several genes that it targets to the to the uh, temporary chloroplast, to the kleptoplast. No question about it. But what's really fascinating is if you look at the phylogeny of these genes, several of them are actually very closely related to the homolog from Carinia and Carlidinium. And they're not actually related to the kind of haptophyte that each of them has in its cytoplasm. They're related to each other. And what this means, the reason why this is so important is because it gives us an idea about the order of events. Because those genes preceded the plastid that's now in any of their cytoplasms. So it looks like this. Because those genes exist, we can say that protein targeting actually evolved way back here before RSD, carlidinium, and crania diverged from each other. In other words, these organisms that now have permanently fixed chloroplasts, their tertiary chloroplasts, their ancestor long ago already had acquired genes that they're now targeting to that organelle. And so it had to have a protein targeting system before it acquired those genes. And the, we know the genes were already there. Some of these genes are derived from haptophytes. Some of them aren't. They're derived from horizontal transfer from other kinds of algae. And so it's really clear that these organisms have ancient shared plastid targeted genes um, that precede their organelle. And so this puts the order of events in, in exactly the opposite order from what the textbook thing is. You have protein targeting evolve first gene transfer had to come after that. And lastly is the fixation of the organelle, which we see happen here twice independently and once, maybe it's gonna happen sometime in the future, but it hasn't happened yet. There's another little quirk of photosynthesis I wanna go through really quickly here, that, but it's important to this same topic. If you look at how the photosynthesis works in this Theocystis Antarctica is the kind of haptophyte that RSD eats. And it's got a really normal photosystem, exactly what you'd expect for, for a haptophyte um, with a linear flow of electrons um, predominantly. And it does have the capacity to do cyclic electron transport, but it's massively inefficient. So it probably mostly uses the linear electron transportation or the linear flow, which is what all the measurements of photosynthesis suggest it's doing. However, if you look at RSD, the same plastid, remember this is, it just eats this organism and keeps its plastid. If you look at how photosynthesis works in RSD, it only uses cyclic electron flow. The linear electron flow is gone and it just uses cyclic electron flow through plastiquinin. So, and we know this is dependent on this, uh, uh, this strange NDH. So why would it do this? Because it's really inefficient. The, the phaeocystis is doing a much more efficient version of photosynthesis when it's free living. And then when it gets eaten and taken up and kept by the dinoflagellate, it reverts to a much less efficient form of photosynthesis. Why would it do that? The answer, I believe, is strictly got to do with this integration process and, and genes moving into the host. Because for the host to support cyclic electron transport, uh, it would require more than 13 plastid targeted proteins. So 13 genes would have to get from the haptophyte or something else into the nucleus of the dinoflagellate and be targeted back to this cryptic or this kleptoplast. To do cyclic electron transport, it only needs three. 
And that's a huge difference. This is pretty easy to imagine happening over time sort of at random. This is extremely difficult to imagine happening over time at random. It, it has happened in other organisms. It will happen perhaps in some of these. But in the near term in RSD, it's easy to imagine how you could persist for a long time keeping your plastid uh, and benefiting from it with a very small number of genes. And making that leap to the more efficient version is going to require quite a bit more investment in this, in this partnership. And so we believe that the, the plastid targeting system and the acquisition of genes to create the proteins to target is actually one of the really important um, sort of blocks in this process. And it's because it's so early. So let's just back up a bit and think, well, what does this tell us about? So if this sort of you know textbook version is backwards, what, what's right? This linear model, I call it, of endosymbiotic origin of plastids, I don't think makes sense. And the case from the, ha from the haptophyte kleptoplast gives us the first evidence that it's not right because it shows that the order of events is not this. So what do we think happens? So I think it's cyclic. Origin of organelles is cyclic. It's a cycle. Okay. So I'll walk through this a little bit. There's a couple of papers that have proposed things like this. There's a version of this was proposed quite a long time ago called the shopping bag model by Tony Larkham and Chris Howe. Um, and then I also proposed a, something called a targeting ratchet model that's very similar, uh, but has a, a couple of different aspects to it, especially the rationale for why it happens. There's no rationale in the shopping bag model, but I actually don't know if it's true, but I had an idea about why it might happen. Okay, so the first part, very simple, cycle of eating and digesting. Lots of stuff does this, it's not dramatic, you know, eukaryotes eat algae, digest them. That's just heterotrophic feeding. <coughs> the second step would be what I think of as klepto farming. So this is like kleptoplasts in a way. I use the term, farming is a good word for this because it's what you're doing here. You're, you're keeping these things inside your cell and you're harvesting the benefits of having it there. And ultimately it's bad news for the thing being farmed because it's gonna get eaten. So it's like cows. Um, being in a farm, sure, there's lots of cows. Cows are very successful if you just went and counted them up on the planet, but their, their outlook in the near future is not good because we're going to kill them and eat them. So it's the same in this sort of transient association. It's, it's basically the purple cell is farming the green cell, extracting benefits from it, and when it's done with it, it kills it. Okay? Um, and then... Oh, right. I meant to say uh, there's actually a version of this that was developed later on for the mitochondria as well to explain the origin of eukaryotic cells, which is interesting. Sort of a klepto farming kind of model. But anyway, then the, the key step is you got to think about, well, what would be, why would you bother keeping something for longer? If you can just go out and eat another one, why do you bother prolonging that relationship, the farming? Why do you, instead of keeping it for a week, you keep it for a month? Why do you do that? Um, because it's actually difficult because the organelle will be breaking down. And especially if you have to start getting proteins and targeting to it, it it's, a, it's a difficult thing to explain. And I actually don't think that it happened like that on purpose. I think it was actually just the byproduct of another interesting functional change. Because if protein targeting came first and not last, then you have to think to yourself, well, why would a cell start targeting protein? To its farmed, you know, organelle or organism or whatever you want to call it. Uh, because the idea that it was targeting proteins for genes that it got from that thing doesn't make any sense. So what I think happened was it was targeting transporters. Because if you think about you're farming something inside your cytoplasm and you want to get the most out of it before you digest it, well, transporters. Because it's not sugar, because most algae are producing so much sugar it's just leaking out of them but there's many nutrients where you could imagine that you could tap into that farmed algae and pull something really useful out if you targeted a transporter into its cell wall and so the benefit for the host here is to 
put a transporter in the wall of this thing that it's farming so it can extract nutrients. And protein targeting, in, in my view of how this probably worked, was the reason why, per, uh, or transporters was the reason why protein targeting evolved. So protein targeting was specifically invented to put transporters in the wall of a kleptoplast or a klepto algae to extract nutrients. But once you have protein targeting, that's maybe here, yes, it creates a ratchet. And evolutionary ratchets are really interesting. Basically a ratchet, um, I'm not sure how this translates, but in English, the word ratchet, um, this word right here, is a tool. It's like a wrench, which only goes in one direction. So you turn it one way and it turns the bolt and then it goes click, 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 click. You know, so it's a, it's a way to turn bolts really efficiently, but it's a one directional thing. And so an evolutionary ratchet refers to uh, a force that's almost uh, inevitable or neutral, but which tends to go in one way, okay? And so this is an evolutionary ratchet because if you create a protein targeting system for whatever reason, in this case, I think transporters, any gene that then gets into the, your nucleus can acquire a targeting information that would allow it to be targeted, will be automatically. And so by creating protein targeting, you're enabling more and more and more proteins to be targeted, not the ones that were, the system was originally created to deal with, but anything. And so protein targeting makes endosymbiotic gene transfer. So genes from the transient pieces of food moving into your nucleus and getting targeted back, it makes it inevitable. It has to happen just by chance. There doesn't have to be any reason for it. It's just going to happen no matter what, um, unless something's stopping it. And so this is already putting things in a different order. So now protein targeting evolved for a particular reason that allowed the transfer of genes from the food, in this case, to the, to the host to, to make any difference. And so now they might happen, but those might actually elongate the process as well. You can imagine uh, there's lots of genes you could get from your food and target back to the food that would make it easier to keep that food for longer. Maybe a couple of photosystems or things with accessories to photosystems. There's lots of ways that that could prolong it. And then the last step is the fixation. So in this model, you have these longer and longer term associations like RSD, where you keep the plastid and you target lots of proteins to it to keep it alive for longer and longer and longer. And then one day you just get stuck so you basically don't digest it anymore and you just keep it. Um, and that's kind of an anticlimactic last step. It's not the dramatic initiation. It's just, you know, something that happens one day kind of by mistake. Um, and now you've got an organelle in your cytoplasm semi-permanently instead of just something that you're going to digest. And this is how I think the whole thing takes place. Thank you. Can you hide the bar uh, below the, the, the screen, please? Hi. Yeah, good. I'm good. Okay, so do we? Is this important? Is it general? Is it this idea? Does it apply to lots of stuff? I think yes. I mean, it, we already see evidence for this in the RSD case, but it's actually all over the place. Because if you look at plastids. If you, these are all studies, these are all papers that describe uh, the phylogenetic evolutionary history of genes in the nucleus of some algae that are targeted at the plastic. And what they all found was that the genes didn't always match the phylogenetic identity of the plastid. So this, this you heard from John Archibald uh, a couple of weeks ago, I think, when he was a postdoc in my lab, one of his first studies, was to look at chloroarachnophyte algae, which have a plastid derived from a green algae. And what we found was a whole bunch of the plastid targeted proteins weren't actually green algal, but they'd come from stromenopiles or red algae or something else. And at the time, people tended to interpret this as evidence for horizontal gene transfer after the plastid origin had taken place, which is exactly what we said. But actually, it could be that this is evidence of the sort of piecemeal uh, picking up of genes during a long cyclic process of establishing a plastid. 
because you don't necessarily need to be eating the same kind of algae all the time, certainly not at first, and protein targeting might evolve early, and then you're getting genes from the various kinds of algae that you're eating, and they're all being targeted back to subsequent algae. That's the basis for this, uh, the shopping bag hypothesis that I told you is very similar to the one that I just showed you. And so these studies here um, might actually be evidence for how endosymbiosis gave rise to the plasmids in the first place and not evidence necessarily for more recent horizontal gene transfer involving plasmid genes. It's an intriguing possibility that's consistent with both of them. But then when you start going through other organelles, you see exactly the same pattern over and over again. Mitochondria, same thing. Mike Gray's uh, team using proteomics suggested that actually a very small proportion of the proteins that get targeted to a mitochondria are related to the alpha proteobacteria from which the mitochondria arose. Most of them are from some other kind of bacteria. So it's probably a mix of both, uh, you know, evidence for the, the, the way that the organelle originated, but also some horizontal transfer. Very cool cases are even more recent. You guys have probably all heard of Pollinella down here. This is this testate amoebae in the euglyphids. It's a rhizarian and it has an independent primary symbiosis from, from uh, Synecococcus, cyanobacterium. And looking at its nuclear genome, it turns out that it's also full of genes that are targeted to that Synecococcus, but many of them are not related to Synecococcus. And then, oh, thanks. And a cup of tea. And then even more excitingly, in cases that we don't really think of as organelles, but just bacterial symbionts in an obligate relationship with animals. So this is a, this famous mealybug case that has um, uh, bacteria living inside other bacteria living inside the mealybug that support its uh, growth by giving it amino acids. There's also now evidence that the animal encodes genes that are targeted to the bacteria but they're not derived from the same kind of bacteria. Uh, they're not derived from the same lineage of bacteria as, as the bacteria that, um, that are themselves. In other words, they're getting genes from all sorts of sources and targeting them to these symbionts, which is exactly what this model would predict happens when you create an organelle. So this does seem to be uh, a general principle in organelle evolution and also one that suggest that we've got the order of events completely backwards and have to rethink that. So again, I'll, I'll stop and take any questions if there are any. Or I can just move on. I only have a tiny little bit more to talk about because I'm not going to talk about the last part much at all. I'll make this quick. Everyone's probably tired of me by now. And that's redundancy. Um, this is just something else to think about when you're thinking about anything to do with cell biology and molecular biology, to be honest. Uh, we are terrible at thinking about redundancy in evolution. We assume that redundancy is bad and will quickly get eliminated. That uh, having two parallel systems doing the same thing, we assume that there can't really be selection for that. One of them's gonna disappear, okay? Um, so, but let me give you an idea why this gets you into really terrible um, intellectual hot water quickly. So this is a, just a model of, yeah, this is the mitochondria and where it fits into um, metabolism in a cell. So here's the cell, here's the mitochondria, okay, just a little metabolic map. So. When you see people talk about the origin of mitochondria, they um, oftentimes uh, look at organisms that have lost mitochondrial metabolism. So here's some examples. The microspritia, uh, Diplomonas, Parabasala, Archimedes. Um, These are organisms that have reduced their, their mitochondria down to a tiny little relic uh, mitosome organelle that doesn't really participate in um, carbon metabolism, except for the, the parabasala do in a very strange sort of way. Um, and so what you tend to see is if you think about the metabolism of these things and the way people think about how it works is they basically just delete the mitochondria. And 
In some cases, it's actually not a bad representation of what these organisms are doing. They have glycolysis and they usually have some sort of fermentation afterwards and all that other mitochondrial metabolism isn't there. And, and this is fine for understanding these organisms, but it's really terrible for trying to imagine what the host was like before the mitochondria arose. So if you want to you want to think about well, what was the what was I'll call it a eukaryotic host before the mitochondria was taken up? What was its metabolism like? This is a terrible model for what its metabolism was like, and we know that for a fact because when you look at the archaea that are most closely related to eukaryotes, so this is the metabolic map of a bunch of Asgard archaea. These are these really cool the Loki archaeota, um, for example. They all have the TCA cycle, just for example. And so to say that the ancestral eukaryotic uh, host that took up the mitochondria was like this is preposterous. Because every bit of evidence that we have suggests that it's closest relatives, uh, that if you reconstruct the ancestral state of that organism, that it would have had massive amounts of metabolism that's now taking place in the mitochondria. In other words, when the mitochondria was picked up, there was probably tons of redundancy. The host already had the TCA cycle and so did the mitochondria. And ultimately the mitochondrion kept it and the host didn't, okay? Which is how we tend to see these things play out. But you can see how that changes your view about what that organism was like. A lot of these syntrophic hypotheses about the origin of eukaryotes are really, I would say, discolored. They're kind of misled by this um, inability to accept the fact that there would have been both of these pathways going on at the same time. But we have tons of evidence that this happens. I've already showed you a bunch. In the Gregorines, um, this slide, uh, this is back to the Apicomplexa up here. And I, unfortunately, I just have a couple of Gregorines here, but the, and these are the Chromera and Vitrella algae that I told you about, and the predators and different colors, but the same organism. It's either those squirmids, these are dinopetulates. So I talked about the biochemical pathways that their plastids had, but I didn't mention that the cytosol has parallels of most of them. So yes, they make fatty acids in the plastids of many of these things, but they also make fatty acids in the cytosol. It's a different pathway. It's completely non-homologous, or it's not non-homologous. It's very distant. The isoprenoids I mentioned are the the important one for the plastid, and that's because strangely they've lost the cytosolic pathway, but it's actually an exception. This is the, the mavinolate pathway that most eukaryotes have. These organisms don't. Tetrapyrroles, so the heme pathway, again, it's uh, largely redundant. So there's a huge amount of biochemical redundancy in these organisms, and it's maintained because both pathways are important for something. So it might be part of your life cycle, it might be certain kinds of amino, or of, uh, Lipids are made by the plastid and other kinds are made by the, the host cytosol, but they're both important. Um, so there's all sorts of different reasons why you might retain this kind of redundancy. And, and we know that it has a big impact. And I'm just gonna show one last slide. This is this really weird organism that we discovered a couple of years ago called Rodelphus. And it's a, it's a heterotrophic flagellate that goes around eating other eukaryotes, but it's the sister group to red algae. And in many ways, it couldn't be any more different from red algae. Uh, red algae don't have flagella, they're autotrophs, they don't do phagocytosis, they tend to have fairly small genomes with a rare, fairly limited repertoire of genes. Um, Rodolphus is opposite in every way. It's got more than 35,000 different genes. It's a flagellate that swims around and eats stuff by by phagocytosis. But it still has a plastid. And what its plastid does in this case, it, it isn't the same as the apicomplexans. All it does is make heme. That's the total function of its plastid. So it still has the cytosolic avinylate pathway for, photo, for, for isoprenoids, and it has the fatty acid pathway in its cytosol as well. And the reason why this is interesting is because these pathways are extremely rare in the red algae and green algae and other archaeoplastids. They were assumed to, um, some of them have been lost early on. 
And this organism shows that that level of redundancy was actually maintained for quite a long time, even though before we looked at Rodelphus, it wasn't obvious. It was only when we discovered this organism that we realized that redundancy was quite common in the ancestors of these organisms. And if that's true of phagocytosis, that's an interesting question because it would suggest that the ancestor of red algae and green algae uh, and maybe glaucophytes was actually mixotrophic. Um, the alternative is that this organism has reinvented phagocytosis. We, we don't know the answer to that yet, but it, it's an interesting um, possibility that again, harkens back to the, the um, mixotrophic uh, ancestry of the dinoflagellate and apicomplexans. So this is a cool organism that we're looking forward to working on even more. And I just want to end with that. I'm actually uh, getting my, I'm losing my voice anyway. So I'll just take questions for a little while. Okay, here's one. Um, since many different animals have eaten in cycles, is there a reason why it's hard to find a DNA relationship between plastids and living algae? Okay, good question. So the question is if, if the plastids originated in a cyclic thing, would that explain why it's been so hard to find exactly what kind of cyanobacteria arose from a plastid? That would be true if we were primarily using genes that are currently encoded in the nucleus to find that relationship. But actually we're mostly using genes that are currently still encoded in the plastid to look for that relationship. And those genes should all come from that thing at the very end that was fixed. So if what I said is true about cyanobacteria and the original origin of photosynthesis in, that, in eukaryotes, then there's a bunch of cyanobacteria were being eaten in cyclically. And then at the end, one of them got fixed. So that one still, um, the relationship between it and the plastid genome should still be solid because there's no weird business there. And in fact, I think the, the answer to the question you asked is that we haven't sampled very well because uh, David Marrera's lab, you, you guys probably know this, had a paper, what was it, like two years ago, where they described a new lineage of uh, cyanobacteria that were called the, I can't remember, but somebody else can probably remember, um, that is closely related to plastids. And it was fascinating because it's freshwater, which I don't think any of us saw coming. But I'd look that up. If I could give you any more details, I would. But it's David Marrera and uh, Puri Lopez Garcia from France. Um, and it was a very nice paper, very convincing um, sister group to the Plastids. The next question is divided in two parts. Then I will put the first part first, and after the next part. Okay, do I think that the transfer of plastid genes to the nucleus would make the plastid acquisition permanent and not transient? Uh, no, I don't. I think that there probably was a stage where the nucleus was acquiring genes from its food and from other sources, and then targeting proteins derived from those genes back to a farmed kleptoplast, exactly like what we see in RSD. So RSD is getting genes or proteins targeted to it, but ultimately it is being digested, the plastic. So I think there has to be a stage where you go through that phase. And it can be really long. RSD has been maintained in the lab with no food for three years. So it can keep the, that plastic for three years. And the only reason, this is Becky's experiment, the only reason they stopped is because their incubator broke. So we don't know how long it can last, but it is temporary nonetheless. So I think there has to be a, an intermediate stage. Uh, I mean, less prone to discharge the plastids in any other. Not sure I quite understand that. Do you mean once you get nuclear encoded plastid targeted genes that you're kind of locked into this road where you're going to keep it for longer and longer? Because that I think is probably accurate. Yes. Maybe not inevitably, but it certainly makes it more likely that you're going to keep it for longer and longer. Okay, 
Other questions, people? Ask about anything you like. Uh, it's okay here. No, um, I think uh, well, this, this is complex. Uh, protein targeting uh, is very interesting to understand how the process work during the the the, in the, the endosymbiosis, the, especially in the secondary endosymbiosis. But my point is, um, for example, for Cleptoplastida group, uh, the original mechanism of protein targeting uh, does not facilitate uh, the, the process to transport uh, any protein in, in this event, for example, because, well, we expected an, actually like a, a new new protein targeting uh, that uh, could be originated in the process, but the original uh, has some influence in the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how do these protein, like, there's a whole bunch of questions in there. That's really an interesting topic. Um, protein targeting is, is fascinating and complex and not always very well understood. So let's take the RSD case. Uh, I mean, the honest truth is nobody knows how proteins are targeted to the kleptoplast. The leaders aren't the same as the leaders you would see on a gene or, uh, for a protein targeted to the ancestral dinoflagellate plastid. In fact, that's why we can tell them apart, because we know what the dinoflagellate targeting plastid should look like, and these don't look like that. In fact, the leaders on the plastid targeted genes to Carinian carlidinium are also very strange. They don't look like what we would expect to see. And in that case, it's not even totally clear. So one of the really big differences between primary plastids and secondary plastids is that primary plastids are in the cytoplasm. Secondary plastids are in the endomembrane system. And so the targeting goes by a a transit peptide for primary plastids, and in a secondary plastid, they use a signal peptide to get into the endomembrane system, and then the transit peptide. It goes through the selma and the ticks and the tox and gets into the plastid. Tertiary plastids are another kettle of fish. And in a lot of cases, we don't know how it works. So in Carlidinium and Carinia, they're still arguing about how many membranes they're surrounded by, and we don't really know the relationship between the plastid and the host. In the ones with the diatoms, it looks like there's no targeting. So the host nucleus doesn't encode any proteins that are targeted into the plastid of the diatom because the diatom kept its own nucleus. And it's a big thing. It's not like a nucleomorph, it's monstrous. It's probably many times the size of the human genome. So but they've all reacted a little bit differently. And of course the cryptomotid one is even more freakish because it has to go through being eaten by a ciliate first, and then it gets eaten by a dinoflagellate, and it looks like it might be transient in some species and more permanent in others. It's a big mess. So the, it's a great question, and it requires a lot of really, really solid cell biology to be done on these systems, which is, of course, very challenging because they're so complex. Um, but the nut of it is, yes, you would think it has to invent a new system. And the fact that we keep now finding that the host hasn't lost its original plastid, I think underscores this, because you can't use the original system to target to your kleptoplast or to your new tertiary plastid if you're still using the old system to target to your ancestral plastid. And that, that mystery cryptic dinoflagellate plastid that I talked about in RSD and probably in cranium carlidinium is also now in the dinatoms, in the diatom containing tertiary plastid. So it's probably the rule, not the exception, that you keep your old plastid too. And these cells are just getting more and more complicated and the targeting gets more and more complicated with it. So I'm, I'm afraid I, I can't answer those questions because they're, they're really at the cutting edge, I think, of where we are in understanding these systems, the cell biology. Okay, but uh, I understand uh, a little bit about uh, this point because it was some 
itself. And and uh, another point is about the the, the external membrane, membrane of the chloroplast in some groups that uh, uh, we have secondary or tertiary. I don't know more because uh, some papers are making some progress in this question. Yeah. But for example, in diatoms, I work with diatoms. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the sternal membrane uh, connected with the sternal membrane of the nucleus. Yeah. And the, how can uh, this uh, work uh, during the evolutionary process to have the same, it's like the same membrane, for example, or not? It's just a, a fusion membrane. Well, I think you're right, I, and I th I would actually say you're, it is the same membrane, especially in in diatoms and haptophytes and cryptomonas. It's actually physically continuous. So, um, you know, with the nucleus and with parts of the endomembrane system. So, um, so if you go back to primary symbiosis, you know, uh, I make when I teach this in my own class, I make them go through the exercise of a cell eating another cell, and what do you get? And you know the students. The problem is they get to that stage where there should be three membranes, and then they go, "Well, wait a minute, why is there two? And the answer is, "Well, one of them had to be lost." And then you go through, "Well, which one was lost?" And you know we don't really know that, but we're pretty sure it had to be the 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 phagosome, right? Which also just makes sense because if you lose the phagosome, it doesn't fuse with the lysosome, and you don't digest the cyanobacteria, and it, it's a sensible argument so then the question is well why didn't that happen with secondary symbiosis because they're always in the endomembrane system and so i think it's just a different question which is well why didn't it digest it um and personally i think that has to do with the uh, i mean i don't i'm no expert in the cell biology of these things but i guess i i think that it has to do with the sophistication of the protein targeting system through the endomembrane system the fact that the cell was so good at it's so good at targeting proteins to different parts of the endomembrane system it comes down to how did the cell learn not to digest this and that's probably a protein targeting solution like once you stop membrane fusions of certain types based on what kind of proteins are embedded in that membrane and stop targeting uh, proteins to this part of the endomembrane system so as that became a distinct location, maybe not physically distinct, like in your case where you said it's, it's continuous, but in terms of the information and what proteins are being targeted to different parts of it, it still is distinct. In that case, because of the Selma complex. So anything that recognizes is recognized by the Selma complex is gonna go through into the plastid and the cell must know, you know, to protect that, I guess is what I would say. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know how it works though. It's a fascinating question. Yeah, but it, it's really, really interesting this process, all this process, to know it. And uh, we have a lot of data. In the and just, to, just to add to that, I guess, I mean, you must, you, you're aware, uh, I'm sure, of how it's going to be different in every case. So yeah. what we learn in diatoms, in some some of the things we learn are going to be universal across all these things, but there's some things that aren't. And that is exactly the part of the system where we would be most likely to, to find differences between different kinds of algae. And we already see it. Like um, in my lab, we were interested in the Selma complex and we went looking for DER1 in organisms with green algal secondary plastids and we can't find it because they probably don't even use the Selma complex, right? That's, that's really just been worked out in things with red algal plastids. And there's all sorts of cases like that, like the way that dinoflagellates move proteins through the Golgi to get to the plastid, and so do euglenids. Um, they can't have a Selma complex because they've lost that whole membrane. Um, that's the step, I think, where there's going to be the most diversity. Another question, people? Okay.
Uh, at the end of your presentation, at the end, or, uh, I have another question that I want that you think about. Uh, it's not a guessing game, but uh, for example, what do you think? What are your expectations about the studies in this this team, this issue uh, for the future? For example, ten years. Uh, what do you think that uh, we will uh, reach? We will discover about uh, maybe uh, taking into account uh, the discoveries that the reason of the discoveries that we are made in, in this point of the discoveries of the algae, and uh, also uh, what, uh, no, how, how can we, uh, the researchers from Latin America and from South America, to contribute with these discoveries in, in, the, in the future, in the new mm. studies? Wow, that is, that's a tough one. Um, there's uh, one of the things that, um, well, the, the, the first thing that jumps to my mind is, is something that we're, we're not very good at appreciating that anybody can contribute to is um, straight up exploration. There's one thing I've learned through my entire career, it's that we don't know much about biodiversity of microbes in particular. Algae are probably the best studied fraction of that. And we still, there's loads of interesting stuff that we've never characterized. And the non-photosynthetic relatives of them, even way more so. So we have, in my lab, uh, like I, I love hiring people that are really good at going out in nature and doing natural history. Even though my lab does genomics mostly, um, because there's so many cool things out there that we don't know even exist. We just have to go look. And like Rodelphus uh, was isolated by my good friend Dennis from Russia. And he goes to Russia. He lives in Russia for eight months of the year. And he spends the eight months going out and getting things into culture and looking in the microscope and characterizing new organisms and this sort of this ancient wisdom of like how microbiology was done and until the advent of molecular biology. And then for four months, he comes to British Columbia with a suitcase of these amazing new organisms. And we go crazy on them with genomics. And so you get a bit of everything. And that's been a fantastic uh, relationship for us. But it, but it's it's clear to me that most of the sort of magic comes from the old school going out and looking around. Just go grab some samples and look for weird things and learn what's there and what doesn't make sense. And so um, if we had more people that were actually paying attention to natural history and the, the, the diversity of the microbial world and sort of trying to find new things that we haven't characterized yet, we, that would be fabulous. There'd be, there's still so much room to discover amazing things doing that, in my opinion. I mean, we do. Um, the other thing is that there's this whole idea that we should have some new field called evolutionary cell biology. And this leads me to the second thing that people don't appreciate enough, which is just thinking about data and ideas. So uh, I'm interested in the origin of eukaryotes, OK? And it's a lot of it's wrapped up in this stuff, the origin of organelles. Um, and I'm also interested in the way that the history of science dictates how we think about things. So the order of events in the history of science leads us to think about things in ways that would be different if we discovered things in a different order. So if you discover A and then B, you believe Z. If you discovered B then A, you believe X. But we're not really supposed to think like that, are we? We're scientists. We're supposed to look at the data and interpret it, but we don't. And so. We need more people that are actually just thinking about the data clearly and without a bunch of baggage and without trying to prove their pet theory is correct. My PhD advisor is a very smart man named Ford Doolittle, and he's become a philosopher. He's closed his lab, and now he does philosophy. And he said something to me once that is very true about scientists. We're, 
we're supposed to go out and disprove things or attempt to disprove things, right? So I just finished saying, we need to do more exploration. But in terms of testing hypotheses, we're supposed to disprove things. And we're not doing that. He says, we're actually verificationists. So we go out and we try to prove what we already believe is true, OK? And we really have to stop doing that. Because we believe things that aren't true all the time. And so this business about endosymbiosis and turning everything on its head, I love that. It makes this way more fun. If Lynn Margulis was wrong about almost everything, that makes the field more interesting, I think, to me. Um, I love turning things on their heads and saying it's backwards from what everybody thinks. It, 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 it makes it more exciting. So, and I think, you know, when I teach this stuff too, I think students tend to agree. But then when you get old, I think you stop doing that. And you start just trying to prove all the things that you already believe. So I don't know. I'd love to see more young people actually coming around and, and flipping all this stuff over and showing us it's wrong, showing us that we're making all these assumptions that are basically a bunch of load of, you know, what. So yeah, clear thinking uh, without the baggage. That would be another good one. Good advice and good expectations. Oh. People, another questions? We're good. I think, yeah. Well, I hope that was entertaining. I can't tell. This is a weird experience doing this kind of thing. Uh, but anyway, I hope it made sense. Um, um, we can finish now. Are you prepared to continue? I'm done. Uh, yeah. Okay. Then uh, we have uh, some uh, elogies. You can see elogies in place. Just a minute, please. <laughs> Well, uh, some thanks for you. Uh, compliment. Sorry. I, I, I didn't remember compliment. <laughs> we have a lot of compliments compliment for you uh, in your chat. Then after we can access and verify the questions and the participation of the people here. And for me, well, I thank I thank you so much for your lecture here and your participation here, and we expect that uh, in the future we can contribute again. We uh, we expect that uh, this team, uh, this team, uh, became more well studied here in Brazil and research, and, and because that we are trying to to came with this new research. Then thank you so much your thank presentation. You. And uh, uh, for us, it's, uh, it was our honor to receive you. Oh, it was my honor. Thanks. I appreciate the invitation. I hope it was fun. Yeah, it was good. Okay. Then, people, bye. Until tomorrow. Bye. 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 Good luck with the rest of the class. Uh, thank you. Bye. <laughs>